We've been in a series entitled Love Life, and I'm excited we're going to conclude our series today. And I've entitled the message MIA, Missing in Action, MIA. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate our hearts to your word today, that we would see you clearly today, Lord. Lord, I I know that you have called us for such a time as this. Give us ears to hear, Lord, eyes to see. And change us in a way that only you can. And Lord, we thank you for the rain. But we know summer is coming. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 And amen. Well, well, let let me take you to a species of birds for a moment. That are a little bit interesting. They're called barnacle geese. Now, barnacle geese have no problem with action. Barnacle geese are never MIA. They are always about action. In fact, at a very young age, they're jumping off cliffs (laughs) before they can fly. And you might be a little bit perplexed. Why in the world is this taking place right now? Is this even safe? Well, Well, no, it's not, actually. But see, barnacle geese, they don't feed their young. They leave after the chicks are about a day old. I don't know if they're called chicks. Are geese called chicks? Maybe they are. But the little baby geese, when they're a day old, their parents leave. And they watch from afar, knowing that a hunger will begin to fester in their little ones. Eventually, the the geese, the, the little geese begin to cry out in hunger. And their parents can hear their cry. And so they call their young from the ground to make the plunge. Talk about terrible parenting. (laughs) Are you gonna let this cute little bird fall and bounce on the rocks? This is what it looks like. You can watch it on YouTube. They just bounce off of rocks, boom, boom. Hopefully they don't hit a crack or a crevice. Only to, listen, only to be welcomed by Arctic foxes who are waiting for their little meatballs to fall out of the sky. Like, hey, here we go again. It's time. Get ready, boys, right? Other predators are waiting, but it's this fall, which majority of them survive, that prepares them for a life of tension, for a life of battling predators. It prepares them for tumultuous weather. They don't live an easy life. But can I just tell you, in light of all of this, for the barnacle geese, leaving the nest is not an option. It's just not an option. God has created these birds to fly. He's made them resilient. They were meant to soar. They were never meant to remain in the nest. Because if they do, the hunger is going to start to brew. And we're going to see very quickly that something will be missing. From these little birds, there's going to be a longing for more. There's there's going to be a hunger that's birthed on the inside. That's going to produce a cry. They're going to be crying out, I need some food. And then their parents are going to say, yeah, make the plunge. Jump out of the nest. Isn't it the worst thing to feel like something is missing? Like It's one thing to have your phone missing. It's, It's another thing to have your wallet missing or your watch. But anybody have those panic moments? I think a lot, of, a lot of times with the phone. All of a sudden, oh, oh, okay. It's like you just got saved. You got your phone. It's like, oh, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Like we, we, have, we have these moments. But, but do you remember how it was before Christ? Do you remember you had moments of happiness? You had moments of fulfillment, but nothing could go the distance. There was still this perpetual longing. There was this hunger on the inside that something is missing. And then what happens, you trust the Lord, you begin to build a relationship with him, and that void is no longer there. Why? Because what our hearts were longing for was for a Lord and for a Savior. We were longing for the grace of God. We were longing for God's forgiveness. All of a sudden now in Christ, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become brand new. He rescued us. He redeemed us. He restored us. He's renewing us. Oh, it's amazing. And that void in that moment is filled. 
But then something starts to happen. You start spending time with God. You start spending time in prayer. You're reading the scripture. You're plugged into Christ-centered community. You're in a small group. And a hunger, a new hunger starts to birth on the inside of you. And you're wondering, like, like where does this hunger even, even come from? Where, where, what, what is happening here? See, in Christ, the eternal void was satisfied. But then there comes this hunger on the inside of you for God in a way that you, you never knew. That hunger isn't just satisfied, but it grows in a new way. You're like, Lord, I know there's greater heights. I know there's greater depths. I know there's a greater intimacy with you. I want to experience your power, your love, and your presence on a greater level. And a new hunger starts to birth. But it's interesting, with this, when this new hunger starts to birth, a lot of time we navigate toward consumption. I must just need more of what I already have. Maybe I just need to spend more time in prayer. Maybe I need to spend more time in the word. Maybe I need to get into 20 small groups. <laughs> and guess what? Maybe you need those things. Maybe that is true. Maybe that is what God is speaking to you. But I think there's one area that often gets neglected that if we continue to neglect, there will be a perpetual longing on the inside of us until we plunge out of the nest. You see, what may be missing is mission. What may be missing is mission. Now, even for some of you today, you're like, oh, he's going to talk about mission. I thought you were going to talk about me today. Give me something for me. This is for you. It's for you way more than you think. But it's not just for you. It's so much bigger than us. See, when we think about drawing close to God, a lot of times we can think about everything but mission. What more can I get? What more can I consume? But in the kingdom of God, I would like to say this, the kingdom of God, spiritual consumption was always meant to lead to spiritual contribution. Like this is one of the keys to us growing spiritually and encountering Jesus at a deeper level in a real way. I like to say it like this, is that true consumption of Christ will lead you to the commission of Christ. And this is a great gauge to know if you are really drawing closer to God is there will start to be a deeper compassion for the lost, for people who don't know him. Now, I say that because the more that you are filled with him, the more that you are consuming him, this is the heart of God. This is why Jesus entered into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. This is why prophetically spoken by Zechariah that he would come riding in on a donkey. Why was he riding in? Because the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. This is the heart of God. And the closer we get to him, this hunger to seek and to save begins to expand on the inside of us. A capacity, a, a, a hunger, a desire to see people experience what we have experienced in Christ. It starts to permeate. But if we're not careful, it can also dissipate. But there's something about drawing closer to God that a hunger is birthed, but it's so much more than hunger. It's, it's far beyond hunger. In fact, you were created to know him and make him known. Look what Paul says, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Everybody say walk. walk. See, we were not made for the nest. And if, if our church service or our small groups or our, 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 you know, what we do here uh, on a Sunday or midweek, if this is our proverbial nest, can I just tell you we were made for so much more? And don't get me wrong, I love Sundays. I love small group. I love people gathering together in Jesus' name. I love all of this. But can I just tell you we were made for so much more. We were created to plunge out of the nest into darkness where there are wolves. Jesus said, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. I'm sending you out into the darkness, into the tension. That's what we were made for. And it's, there's nothing worse than living a life that you were not designed to live. And the birds, if they stay in the nest, the barnacle geese will die because that is, they will not find food there. There will be an element of their life. Even though they're alive, they will eventually begin to starve to death because it's not the way that God has designed them. 
Now, this, this word, good works, or this little phrase in the Greek, it means God created us for deeds that are birthed from an internal passion or a hunger that are carried out with intention and purpose. That when the king of kings is ruling and reigning on the inside of us, something begins to stir, something begins to manifest that we can't get away from. We're compelled to go. But it's not just the services. It's not just to events. It's not just to conferences. It's not just to serve days that God created you and I in such a way that we are to walk in the good works he's created us for. And what, what, he's, what Paul is saying here is in every day life that your lifestyle you are designed to walk in everything that God has called you to it everywhere you go everywhere you place your foot where God has placed you and planted you is not by accident so I was driving uber not too long ago and I only drive uber in the four cities Dublin Livermore Pleasanton and San Ramon why because it keeps me around the world it keeps me with lost people I never want to get caught up in my Christian bubble as a pastor. It's easy to do that. So I don't want to just preach at you like, go reach your friends, go reach the world. And, and I'm just in church all the time. So I, I love getting, getting in, in an Uber and, and hanging out and picking up random people. I love it. So this one guy, he's in our city. He's a real estate attorney, but he's also a hip hop artist that writes for DreamWorks and performs for DreamWorks. And so I picked him up, taking him to the airport. We, we start talking. He hasn't done a song in a while. He both performed and wrote the song uh, on Super Size Me. It's, it's a documentary, Super Size Me. He wrote the theme song to that and performed as an artist. And so he's on his way to New York, real estate attorney on his way to New York to write another song for DreamWorks. And he's like, man, I have not been in the studio for a long time. I'm a little bit nervous. And I just get to minister to him. And so we're talking back and forth. And he's like, yeah, my wife and I, we, we've been kind of looking for a church and and so we just get to talking. By the end of the ride, he gets out. He's like, man, I'm ready to do this. I can't wait to get in the studio. I'm excited to go to New York. Let's go. Give me your number. <laughs> and so, so as soon as he's done, he's like, man, it went great. He texts me the new song for a new documentary that's coming out. And, and you just never know. And then, you know, we, we, we've stayed in touch. And then he shows up last week. Amen. Out of the blue with his daughter. Like, what's up, man? It's good to see you. Everywhere. In every way, we are created to walk in this. Peter says he makes it even, even more special and supernatural that God has given each of us a gift as followers of Jesus from his great variety of spiritual gifts. God has designed you intricately on purpose and very uniquely. And as a follower of Jesus, God has given you gifts. And look what he says, use them well to serve one another. Notice how he doesn't say, hey, put them on display so everybody can know you're gifted. Flaunt around and tell everybody how gifted you are. No, he says, use them well. Don't sit on them. Use them well to serve one another. We always like to say on our serve team or, or if you're a small group leader or you're in small groups, they are not designed simply for Sunday or midweek. They are not places of destination. Sunday mornings is not a place of destination. These are not nests. These are vehicles. Connect class, we're just not trying to like get you in the door just to get you to serve in, in a particular area or in a group. No, we, we want you to engage. We want you to grow. We want to help you identify a little bit more how God has made you and designed you. We want to tap into some of your spiritual gifts that you may not even know that you have. But this is the goal. What is all this for? All of this is so you get comfortable living out your faith in front of people you don't know. So that when you get out there, it's not foreign. So that when you get out there, it's not, well, I kind of have my church life in the nest and I get out there and nobody knows anything. And I'm afraid to engage. I don't know how to engage people. I don't know how to pray for people. I don't know. Like, we just want you to be, it just becomes an overflow. All of these areas in our church, ladies and gentlemen, we do not want you depending on Sundays. We do not want you depending on small groups. We don't want you depending on our serve team. We want these to be vehicles that God uses and environments that God uses to foster spiritual growth so that you can take all of that into your everyday life and walk it out, as Paul talks about. And everybody's in a different place. So no pressure. It's just, hey, identify where you are spiritually, and let's take a next step. It's not super complicated. These are vehicles to prep you for every day. But God just didn't create you for good works. He's empowered you for good works. He didn't just give you gifts. 
He's empowered you to use those gifts. It says this in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God has not filled us with power for consumption. He has filled us with his spirit and with power for commission. Are you with me? Now, now, consumption is awesome. We love consuming. And this is how it goes normally in our world. If we're hungry, what do we do? Let's get filled. Fill the belly. But in the kingdom, it's a little bit opposite. See, we love the idea of being filled, but we don't love the idea of being emptied. That's why I like a lot of our worship songs. Fill me, God. Fill me, fill me, fill me. But, but a few of them starting to make their way up. Empty me, empty me. We love the idea of being filled. We don't always love the idea of being empty, but it's so important. Let me tell you why. Jesus said in Mark chapter eight, verse 35. Now, so many times we quote this verse, but never Mark's version. Mark's version says, for whoever would like to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Meaning there's a beautiful reality that we are not called just to be filled with Jesus, but to empty our lives for him and for the gospel's sake. But let me tell you where I think there's a tension. Because some of us are like, empty? I'll show you empty. Look at my week. Look at all I got going on in my life. Look at my kids. Look at my own internal makeup. I'm struggling. Talk about empty myself. I'm trying to get filled. I'm trying to get a couple fillings. But can I just tell you, when I say emptied, I think we get this confused that there's a difference between emptied and depleted. And we have to understand the difference. See, emptied isn't easy. It's not easy for a young girl to not renounce her faith in some of the hostile countries that you'll lose your life as a result of. It's not easy, but there is a, such a filling and an overflow of power in her life that causes her to stand in the midst of severe persecution and empty her life on behalf of others in the gospel. But, but depleted is a little bit different. Depleted is, it, it looks a little bit more like this. I'm, I'm trying to work for Jesus without being filled with Jesus. And so then we're trying to give what we really don't possess. And that's exhausting. And so I think sometimes when we hear, empty yourself, go, and all of us are like, I'm already so tired. Because you're not living from a place of power. You're not operating from a place of fullness. And that's why you can see some of these people. How can you endure severe hardship, persecution, and still give your life away for others? Because there is a filling of the spirit that has empowered people to empty themselves, that's empowered you and I to empty ourselves for Christ and the gospel. But here's the beautiful collision. It's just as a saucer and a coffee cup are a great combination. Imagine this, the more that we empty ourselves, the filling never stops if we'll partake in the well. And so people end up drinking from our saucer, from the overflow of our life. So we're never depleting our cup. We're constantly being filled. David said it like this, my cup, it overflows. And so, so I, I, want, I want you to get this picture. I am not saying, listen, if, if I'm not saying to, to deplete yourself. I'm saying, listen, we are never supposed to choose between filling or empty. We, we get both. God wants to fill us. And then pour us out into the world as his ambassadors. Paul the Apostle said, my life is being poured out like a drink offering. But it's not because the brother is not filled. Like the fact that he's enduring extreme persecution as Paul did, they would stone the Apostle Paul. He'd get up. A lot of times, they, many scholars believe that on, on certain occasions that he might have died. But he would be beaten and stoned so bad. Not medicinal stone, but like rocks. All right. <laughs> Pastor jokes. <laughs> You'll get it in the car. <laughs> but like normally you'd wake up like, man, they just stoned me in that city. Man. <laughs> and Paul was like, he gets up, shakes it off like weekend at Bernie's, right? And just walks right back into the city. 
right back into the city. Do they just try to kill you? I know, but I'm filled. And so I got to empty myself. I'm like, I'm excited about this. Are you with me? So if you're feeling depleted, I would check the source of water. Check the source. Check the well that you're drawing from. Are you with me? And so to, to, to work without Jesus, to do the work of Jesus without Jesus is exhausting. But with him, oh, it's fulfilling. It's exciting. Okay, so you're like, Pastor Matt, I don't know if I have that heart. That's okay. No guilt, no condemnation. Let's cry out for it. Let's ask God for that. Maybe you had it at one time and it's kind of simmered down. You got caught up with light. No guilt, no condemnation. Let's cry out for that. And let me, let me give you a few things to consider as we stir a hunger leading into this next week. Three days of fasting and prayer starting tomorrow. Zoom call, 6.30 a.m. every single day. And we are contending, church, this week, not for us, for the lost. We are contending for those who are far from God. We all have issues. We all have struggles. We all have that stuff going on in our life. But listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, we have hope in the midst of all that. People have all that stuff, too, with no hope. Imagine going through life without God. There are so many like that. So the first thing I want you to, to jot down, God, would you stir a hunger on the inside of us? If, if we're going to stir up a hunger, we need to fight to see what Jesus sees. Because a lot of times we pay attention to what we care about. And because our life isn't on the line like it is in other countries, you know, in other, some, some countries, if you give your life to Jesus, you're signing your life away. Your, your family disowns you. I remember one time we had a, a young girl that we baptized. None of her family showed up. It's from the Middle East. She said, I don't even know if I can go home. Because it, it can be very hostile. But what that does, it compels you to make great leaps out of the nest quickly. Because you know that if I say yes to Jesus, I'm all in. But, but by the grace of God, listen, we don't have that issue a ton here. It's a very moderate level. Most of us don't battle in that way, so we have to fight to see what Jesus sees. We got to fight for it. I'm grateful, but I, I want us to see that our nation is just as desperate. We used to be a nation that sent missionaries to the world. Now everyone is sending missionaries here. And I'm just telling you, God has so much more. Look at this. Luke chapter 19, verse 4 and 5. It says, so he ran on ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was about to pass by. Now, this is Zacchaeus. He's a tax collector. He's a Jewish tax collector, partnered with the Romans. Everybody hates him. He's deceptive. He's wealthy. And he's wealthy because he exploits his own people. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, when he was saying hurry down, he was not just calling him out of a proverbial tree. Imagine this, Jesus is walking, there's crowds pressing in everywhere. Zacchaeus, we know from the text, is short in stature, so he's hungry, and he's heard about Jesus. And even though he's wealthy, he has all of these things, there's a hunger and a longing on the inside of his heart that says, maybe I can get a glimpse of him. He's not going to want to be close to me, because no rabbis want to touch me. I'm rejected by all of them. But if I can just get a glimpse... Let me climb this tree, mind my own business. And Jesus is walking and he stops and he says, I see you. I see you. He's like, what? You see? Yeah, you in the tree, bro. I see you. And he says, get down quick. I must come to your place. You want to come to my place? Do you know? Like, what? That's, that's like, where's your PR firm? That is social suicide. You don't want to come to my house. No, no, because what Jesus was saying, no, I'm, I'm not just calling you out of a tree, Zacchaeus. I'm calling you down from your rejection. I'm calling you down from your pride. I'm calling you down from your brokenness. I'm calling you down from your life of sin to give you brand new life. And speaking of trees, I've had my own experience this week with my kid. I don't know how she got way up here. Now, mind you. This is not doing it justice. She was, she was like this. I looked up and I thought, how in the world did you get up there? Jackie called me and says, hey, babe, I know you're busy, but uh, our daughter's stuck in a tree. I was like, what? And so then I look. I was wondering, how did you scale this thing? She literally put her hands in the bark and climbed up. Jackie was like, I think we should put her in rock climbing. I'm like, you think? 
And so I get there, and honestly, I'm irritated. I'm like, what are you doing? My goodness. Jackie's in a, in a one-on-one with one of our, our, uh, uh, one of our Connect Team leaders, uh, Christine Lomabau. So Christine's like, oh, I know this is going to be in a sermon. I'm like, yeah, this week. <laughs> and so my first thought was I'm going to have to call the fire department. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes around the corner wow. with the ladder. And this is what he said. He said, yeah, I was, uh, was in my backyard doing some work, and I looked up, and I took a double take. <laughs> he said, that's a kid in the tree. <laughs> then he said he went back to his work. Then he, he looked up, and he thought, how's she going to get down from there? That's high up there. And so he stopped what he was doing. And he said, hey, I have a ladder. I can help you come out of the tree. But he had to see her. Do you know how easy it would have been for him to be like, I don't have the time for that. Oh, man, terrible for their parents. Whoa, is that a kid in the tree? <laughs> Wonder how that's going to turn out. Wait for the fire department. No, but he sees her. We got to fight to see what Jesus sees. Could you imagine? Because we could say, hey, we see you in the tree and we know you ain't getting down from there. But I know somebody that can get you down. Let me give you a ladder to him. Let me show you the way. Let me let me call you down that you don't have to be stuck in that place anymore. We got to fight to see what Jesus sees. I'm a little passionate about this. Can you tell? The second thing is this is we have to pray earnestly. We have to pray earnestly. If God were to answer your prayers, would it change only your world or would it change the people's world around you? If God were to answer your prayers, would it only change your world or would it change the world around you? You know, every great revival, whether it's been in America and uh, across the different continents of the world, has all been birthed in people crying out for their cities crying out for their regions. A lot of times, though, we're so consumed with us, it's really tough. I mean, pray for people we know, we love for sure, but to just cry out for the lost, it can be a fight to see those people. And so we have to pray earnestly because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against principalities and wickedness in heavenly places. In heavenly places. Jesus said in Matthew 9, verse 36, it says, when he saw the crowd. So again, Jesus is seeing the crowds, but he's seen beyond the physical. He's seen their spiritual condition. And he said, man, they're, and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he saw and it moved him to compassion. This is how Jesus sees the lost. This is how he sees sinful humanity. And it goes on to say, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest field. Like this is always the tension. God's plan for the world is the local church. Like, like God does not have a plan B. We are God's plan A. But there is a supernatural component to reaching people. And there's a lot of false prophets. There's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of false teaching. And we need to pray that the Lord would send labors into the field. Even for the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is in the Mamertine prison, writing to his young successor, Timothy. And he's, at a he's in a challenging moment. Paul's coming to the end of his life. And Timothy is in the fight of his life. He's pastoring the church of Ephesus. They're in post-revival cleanup. Heresy and false doctrine is eating up the church. There's a leadership deficit, and he's overwhelmed, lacking confidence. And Paul is like, listen, dude, we have a message that cannot be bound. It is the gospel. But we don't have enough people to carry it. So, Timothy, I need you now to trust the gospel to people who are trustworthy, who will carry it into the earth. And there's a supernatural element to that. Anytime the disciples were at him and they're praying for their selection. Even though this is an all play, all of us as followers of Jesus are called to go into the world. 
but we can't neglect praying that, Lord, you would send labors, that you would do something in our city because it's so much bigger than us. It was so cool when um, we were contending for just to build and expand our kids' department. My wife, Pastor Jackie, she said, you know what, we're, we're going to do something different. Rather than just, you know, kind of waiting for people to come through Connect class or making the ask, she said, we're going to start to pray that God would send forth labor. So she took our black boxes. This is what you get when you jump on board to a team. You get a little T-shirt, a nice little packet we get for you. And she started putting names on them and then, and then putting them on the shelf. And her team and her began to pray over them. And it was so cool to watch God speak to somebody's heart, saying, man, I just felt stirred. I've been feeling really led toward children's ministry. And then Jackie would go back into the back and get their box and say, I've been praying for you. I've been contending. That's something supernatural. Can I just tell you, that reinforces a calling. They're like, man, Lord, to see their name on a box before they even sign on the dotted line that we've been contending and praying for them. This, this, is, this impacted the team so much. Cheyenne, who's also a leader on our uh, students and in our kids' department, she's like, I need employees at work. So she started making boxes and started praying over them. <laughs> and then she got so many employees this last year, she had to fire a couple of them. I'm like, <laughs> maybe we should put a caveat, Lord, just enough. <laughs> but this is supernatural in nature. Are you with me? Yeah. But, but he just doesn't say pray earnestly. The very next verse, he sends his disciples. Look what it says. He says, I want you to go simply and prophetically. I want you to go simply and prophetically. That was my third point. I messed up. Terrible transition. But (laughs) this is what he told his disciples. Jesus called his 12 disciples together, gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. So get the picture. See, pray, and go. And it's in his authority and his power that he gives us to accomplish everything he's called us to. And you're like, well, that's cool for the disciples. What about us? Well, Matthew 28, he he speaks it to us. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. That's to you and I. In light of my authority, go simply and prophetically. Like, what do you mean simply and prophetically? The other day, so bummed. I don't know how we did this, but I bought wrong door handles. Door handles, right? So I bought some right, I bought some wrong. Went to Home Depot in Livermore. They were out of what I needed, of course. Home Depot is always like a three-hour journey. It's it's wild. It's interesting. I don't know why. It just takes forever. Love Home Depot. It just takes a long time. So I look up. They have it in Pleasanton. So I go all the way to Pleasanton from Home Depot, Livermore to Pleasanton Home Depot just to get some doorknobs. And I'm walking into the door aisle, and who do I see? A man who doesn't go to our church, but we have been praying for who has cancer. He has his chemo bag on his side. As soon as I saw him, I was like, oh, I know why I'm here. A simple day for me, a simple aisle, aisle 10. I'm getting some doorknobs, simple but prophetic. I looked at him, I said, I hope you are ready for aisle 10 to get prayed for in the authority, not in my own strength, Not in my own authority, but the authority that he has given me. I said, bro, lift up your hands. We're praying right now. God has not forgot about you. We're not stopping this fight. We're contending with you. Aisle 10, let's go. And so that's what he did. He lifted up his hands and and we're contending in aisle 10. That he would live. For me, it's a simple day. A simple going to the store. For him, it was a prophetic moment that God met me there. God has not forgot about me. That God, you, you sent somebody to tell me and remind me to don't stop fighting. God has called you to live and not die. He's given us the authority to lay hands on people. So beautiful, just lifting up our hands. People are like, what are you doing? I'm like, you want some too? We got you. There's enough to go around. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Sounded good though. Matthew 28, Jesus said again, he said, and surely, he tells his disciples, I am with you always until the very end of the age. The promise of withness when we are on mission, because this is his heart. We don't think about, when we think about being with God, a lot of times we think about consumption, but Jesus says, oh, no, 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 it's it's not just being with me. Yeah, I, I want you to be with me, abide in me for sure. But remind, let me remind you, I am also with you on mission. This is my heart. See, pray, go. 
And so this Palm Sunday, Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem. Everybody is preparing for, for Passover. Everybody's preparing for the feast of celebration. But he's not coming to consume the lamb. He's coming to empty himself as the lamb. He's not coming to, to eat the lamb that will be prepared. He's coming to be the lamb that will be sacrificed for all time for the ultimate Passover. He's not coming to consume. He's coming to contribute everything that would change the world forever. But he tells his disciples on this journey, he says, hey, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. It's a very simple act. But little did they know they're fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9. There's a very prophetic moment attached to such a simple act. Because Zechariah chapter 9 says he will come, the Messiah, riding in on the donkey. It doesn't take much. You always hear us say you never know who's one invite away. You know, we have invite cards for Easter. And I'm just going to tell you, a simple invite, you'll be blown away what God can do with that. It's easy to tuck those things in the side of your car, put them in your Bibles, bookmarks. <laughs> let them fall at the wayside, doing laundry like, oh, 10 flyers. But can I just tell you, there is a, a simple and prophetic utterance on the other side of that card. And you never know. In fact, I want you to check this out. Hi, my name is Richard. This is my beautiful wife, Brittany. A couple years ago, uh, right after COVID, we found ourselves looking uh, for a new church. And one day I was at work, I was talking to a coworker and letting her know that my husband and I have been praying about finding a home church. And she handed me an Easter invite to Fountain Church. Um, that night, we looked it up online and saw that um, a Good Friday service was happening and that they had um, a kids ministry as well. So we came Friday and instantly were greeted by Pastor Lauren. Um, she showed us where to check the kids in and we absolutely loved the service and our kids loved their service as well. So we came back Easter Sunday um, and right away when we walked up, we felt welcome. Pastor Lauren remembered Brittany's name. Uh, she remembered the boy's name. Uh, it was it was amazing, uh, amazing service. The presence of God was was thick. It was it was amazing. We just felt at home right away. So two years later, we both have been a part of the serve team. We both have joined different small groups, and um, we have just seen a tremendous shift in our house from our kids to our marriage. So we are so grateful that we have been a part of Fountain Church and especially joining the small groups has just helped tremendously. It has been uh, truly amazing being a part of Fountain. Uh, my daughter also, uh, she's been directly involved with the church uh, and it's, it's, changed, uh, it's changed her whole outlook on life. When she first moved out here, she said she didn't believe in God. Uh, and she's been baptized since we've been a part of Fountain and now she believes in God. She asked Brittany to pray with her the other day. Feel, it feels like we're actually a part of the body of Christ. Uh, everything has just changed dramatically it's, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, and it all started with an invite. You never know who's one invite away. Come on. <clears throat> so simple. It's so prophetic. One invite can change everything. So I just I want to encourage you as we head into this next week. We all have invite cards. We're going to do that. We're going to fight to see. We're going to pray earnestly because we know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood and we are going to go courageously, simply and prophetically trusting that God is going to meet us. Will you stand to your feet? I want to pray for us. Would you just put your hands out, just like in the posture to receive? Lord, I pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, I pray that you would help us to catch your heart over this next week, Lord. This is not about Fountain Church. This is about eternity. 
This is about your kingdom. This is about your heartbeat. And I'm just asking God that you would help us to fight to see. I, I know it's, it's going to be a wild week that all of us have a lot going on. And, but you placed us simply in every environment on purpose. Simple. Costco line. I was able to invite somebody yesterday. It's a simple conversation. But I just believe that you're going to give us divine appointments this week, God. I pray that, Lord, over every invite, over every invitation, over every personal ask, God, that there would be a supernatural component. That people will be drawn. That the hunger is, is brewing on the inside of them. That, Lord, we are perpetually calling people down from trees this week calling them out from their place of trouble and turmoil and stuck and knowing that there's life. God, I pray that you give us a heart for people. Give, break our hearts for the lost. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Fill us so that we can pour our lives out and be used as vessels for you this week, God. So, Lord, with our hands open, we just receive all that you have. I thank you, Lord, that we receive your authority and your power, your sending. I pray that we would see people like we never have this week. And this week would be an altar for moving forward every week. That this week would be an altar for now every day. And, God, that we wouldn't say no for people, that we would believe supernaturally that you were going to move. And maybe it's not even an invite. Maybe it's just a prophetic word to them. Maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe whatever it may be, God, that you would use us in the earth this week as we fast and we pray and we contend for the lost. Listen, maybe you're here today and you're in a tree and you need to come down. You feel it. You're exhausted. You're tired. Burn out on religion. Jesus said, come learn from me. Take my yoke upon you, for it is easy and my burden is light. Come learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And see that he doesn't change your life. So if you've been away from God, and today is a fresh start, today is a, a renewal of the vows. To so say, Lord, I'm yours, I'm coming home. Or maybe you've been away from, maybe you never have known Jesus personally, and maybe you show up to church, you invite about a friend, and you're like, man, I... I feel like the guy in the tree. I'm dealing with so much stuff. I'm afraid. I'm not really sure how to get down. I don't know what's happening. Nothing is working. Nothing is fulfilling. Nothing is satisfying. I'm inviting you today to come down. I'm going to show you the ladder, and his name is Jesus. You can come down off of that tree and find rest, find refreshment, renewal. So if that's you in either one of those places, with every head bow, every eye closed, will you slip up your hand so I can see you? On the count of three. Ready? One two, three. Slip up your hand right now if that's you so I can pray with you. Just want to pray for you. I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, I see your hand. Thank you, sir. Yep, I see yours. Thank you. Come on, it's a new day. Anybody else that would say, that's me, Pastor Matt. Okay, well, listen, those of you guys that slipped up your hand, we're going to pray with you. We're not going to leave you by yourself. We do church as a team and as a family. So I'm going to give you the words you make them your own. This is your own confession of Christ. I'm going to give you the words like wedding vows, but you got to own them. There's nothing magical about the prayer. It's him. Come on, church. Can we pray with them? Just say, Lord Jesus, I surrender today. I'm coming down. I'm sorry for climbing my way, doing my thing. I'm surrendering to you today. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead so that I could be healed, forgiven of my sin, and set free. So I repent today. I'm turning from my way, and I'm turning to you. Will you come into my place today? Come into my heart, Lord. Lord, have your way. Renew me. Restore me. Revive me. Lord, I surrender today. Fill me with your spirit. I confess you as my Lord. Fill me that I might be emptied for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, 
Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, can we give the Lord a big hand today?